your pet that you're showing on screen and then introduce Shelly. Great. Well, this is Athena. Athena is the all-American brown house cat. Uh, never name a cat after a goddess. It goes to her head. Shelly. This is Casey. Casey Nathan. If you can tell, oh, I don't know if she's going to let you see it. But this is her beautiful little name badge here on her collar. Casey is a five-year-old uh, half Yorkie, half poodle, known as a Yorkie poo. And this is Buttercup, who is a four-year-old black lab who weighs 75 <laughs> pounds. So I'm going to put her down now. My cat, there's there's pigeons nesting right directly above us right now. So she is obsessed. So we've decided that we're going to show you our pets in every live stream slash podcast. But in addition today, we wanted to talk about what's the goal of your YouTube channel for business? Businesses start YouTube channels sometimes to tell everyone how awesome they are. Gwen Miller, is that the way to go? Uh, I mean, look, if you're, if you don't want to have a ton of viewers, sure. If you really just want a little <laughs> vanity project, go right ahead. Who am I to ruin your dreams, Dane? Like, you be you. But if you want to have a loyal audience, no, you can't just say, we're the greatest ever. You should give us a lot of money. It surprisingly does not work. As Shelly saves the day, I see a number of large businesses that have unlimited ad budgets and all they do is they put their ads and every YouTube video can be an ad. They run those YouTube videos as ads and then they just show them on their YouTube channel and that's enough for them. Is that what businesses should do? No, I don't believe so. One thing that I've always felt in the past, and this is working with a lot of beauty influencers, they tend to forget that brands aren't people, they're these entities. And a lot of the time they don't necessarily have feelings either, but the public can have very uh, swaying feelings about them. So it's the brand's job to carefully curate what that feeling should be when you think of the brand. And so that's what I believe that like, especially like, beauty brands and such, they should be coming out with an entire way of structuring how it is to build a culture and narrative to like personalize and make it almost feel like it is a person. Right. Personalizing a channel. So feeling that when you communicate with whoever's on that channel, it's not me versus a corporation. It's not somebody speaking to many people. It's a one-to-one. -one. YouTube is disguised as a one-to-many uh, platform, but I believe, and I think you guys would probably agree, it's a one-to-one -one platform that's just many one-to-ones. Would you guys agree with that? Oh, absolutely. Sometimes the only way that Shelly, this uh, uh, kind of varies slightly is sometimes you can have a channel with multiple people on it, and then it might be three to one, but the audience always stays as a singular entity because the watcher is always a single person. Yep. I would agree with that. I think that especially, I was just going to mention, there are community type of um, hosts on certain things like, you know, um, BuzzFeed or, you know, Tasty or something. They can have a rotating cast, but it's still a particular type of viewer that they're going after. So it's very, just like Gwen said, that the audience is still a singular person and like that ideal client, ideal customer avatar that they're going and gravitating towards, even if the presenter is different. And, and, you know, sometimes, yeah, you may have different presenters across the brand. They may change. Somebody may um, move on to a different company. Other people may come on. I think we've all experienced that in different ways. The, 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 the question is, what is the goal? What should be a goal of a business? And there are many different types of videos. There's influencer videos, there's sponsoring videos, there's ads and so forth. But I want to really get down to what you're making content. Why are you making content? And I think a lot of businesses don't know. No. Yeah. And I have a belief that the way, the reason you're, you're doing this is to invite in people who don't know you exist or who aren't as um, 
don't have a strongest feeling with your brand and you want to help them and guide them through the journey that they're having with your type of products and your types of service, not necessarily yours. And by doing that, becoming their guide, you become a trusted partner. Shelly saves the day. How do you feel about that? Do you have a different feeling? Want to add? I agree. Um, and I feel like there's a few different avenues that some people can go when it comes to creating a YouTube business channel. And that's either to increase awareness or to, I mean, the main goal for most of them is to increase conversions. So there are some other things out there. So if you're trying to create awareness and, and doing things like, here's a whole bunch of frequently asked questions because we don't have enough of customer service people on hand or we're not 24 seven when it comes to that. And so we don't have people up at midnight when you are. Like it's almost um, them making it easier on themselves. But I think the channels that do really well are actually becoming familiar and teaching about what they do and providing that level of comfort and service as well. So I think it can vary. But at the end of the day, what you want are happier customers and more like increased sales. So for most people, I think that's the route that they typically go down versus just a um, just to do it. Mm. And, Dane, and, I have a question yeah. for you, actually. Yeah. Go ahead. Have you ever advised a potential client that actually maybe video may not be the right path for you? Or do you think that every company could benefit from video as long as they find the right approach? I think every company can benefit from video unless you are um, a company that is uh, a la money laundering company. Not a good idea. <laughs> But uh, I think any any company can. I don't think YouTube is for every business because it requires, um, or and actually not every other social platform could be for every business either. Some do better on other platforms, but we talk about YouTube primarily on this channel. And I think that YouTube is not for everyone because it requires a certain type of approach that's different then what I call the feed-based platforms, the feed-based platforms being pretty much every other platform, which is essentially not a place you go to to watch things long form primarily. So I think YouTube specifically, when you're a business, we recommend making videos that people would be looking for or would be interested in if they didn't know your business existed meaning you should use your expertise about your industry, about the things you know about, which are greater than the products that you provide, and talk about that. And then maybe 20% talk about, oh, yeah, and we sell that, by the way, because you want to bring people in with mm -hmm. value and your experience, and thus you become the honest broker that they want to work with. Shelly? Uh, you've 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 managed channels. You've you've run channels for other companies. What is the goal that you find is most effective for businesses when they set out to decide what the content should be about? I think you really have to go back to what is the end result that you would find as define as success, because for some companies it may be different, and so it might actually not be about an increase in something, it could be about sometimes a decrease in something like, I want people to stop, you know, canceling our service, or I want people to stop X and Y and Z. And so it's really important that if you were to base your then metrics or how well your campaign did versus, um, you know, how many people signed up new versus how many people did you retain or did you shrink the, the people, the churn rate, that is a, it's a different like mental model that you have to prepare people for. It's like, what if you only had a 5% increase in signups, but you had a 30% less churn rate? Would you still go in and say that that campaign was unsuccessful? Probably not. If you are looking at the measure of success as dollar amount, it could be dollars, it could be subscribers, it could be, you know, so that's why it's very important to delineate and differentiate that in the very beginning. Yeah, and it evolves over time. You may think it's about one thing. You learn about more how about the, how the YouTube platform works, and you're like, oh, well, that, maybe that wasn't such a good goal. We should try something else, try a different take on things and not be so much about ourselves, but be more about what the viewer wants. Gwen yeah. Miller, you've managed tons of channels that are content that, that 
businesses want to advertise on, but you also have observed so many different channels and work with sponsors and influencers and so forth. When you see a channel and you say they have the wrong goal, what are some of those wrong goals or approaches that they might be using? Uh, one of the big ones is often, I just want to get subscribers for absolutely no reason. Like it's just, they want a big shiny number. And as a business, look, it has very little uh, like benefit for a regular creator, even less so for a business. Because at least as a creator, you could argue, hey, these big subscriber numbers can make me attractive to uh, advertisers who want to advertise on my content. If you're a business, you're not like taking advertisement from other people, so you don't care. And literally that subscriber metric is a vanity metric. It does not matter. It does not influence the algorithm whatsoever. And it, it, it doesn't actually like result in more, more subscribers doesn't result in more views over time. There is some correlation because as your audience grows, hopefully your views grow, but it's just a correlation. It's not causation. So what you should be concentrating on, right, is building that core audience. So when people concentrate on subscribers, number one, and then if they just concentrate on, I want a lot of views, I don't care where the views are coming from, I don't care what the views are doing. This is all I care about. It makes no sense for a business. Yeah. Like a view does not, it does not pay the bills. A view is not a customer. A view is a very small thing. That means you got at least 30 seconds of someone's attention for a very brief period. It is not a measure of success success well for instance i have a friend who has a large youtube channel and she decided to open a small business where she's making marshmallows gourmet little marshmallows as a side business now the thing is people are like oh it'd be really great to buy these but because of different regulations when it comes to shipping across lines they have to come from a commercial kitchen there's a lot of this red tape that happens versus mm -hmm. selling inside of state and so she it doesn't help her to have a whole bunch of people who are watching and let's say international <laughs> for goodness sakes, um, you know, and wanting to purchase things because she can't even ship right now. So she could have 10,000 views all coming from outside of her given state or country. And it is of no benefit because no one can buy anything from her. One of the challenges with YouTube is while they know this information, they choose not to disclose to us common folk what individual video someone is leaving to go to your website. That would be a super nice thing. They know how to do this. They have all the analytics. They could very easily track from Google Analytics to YouTube Analytics, even links within the description, who's coming from which video to your website. They choose I mean, not to. You can do it you yourself. You can do Dave. it with a UTM link. And yeah. we have. We have done this for clients where we what we do is we do a UTM link and we bake that into a bit.ly link so it makes it nice and, and we make it like click here and we, you, we, we give them a different serial number for each one. And it is interesting, particularly if someone is on the HubSpot or the Salesforce platform and they're really good at tracking analytics, they say, hey, we found out that they, people really want to click from this. And sometimes it's to go to a, a free download or a free checklist or something mm -hmm. like that. It is a pain to manage because as the person who has sometimes been managing it you have this serial number that's you know what we do to identify it is we put the the watch page id number in the utm code so basically you just know oh that's why that's how you identify because you might change the title or whatever so you put that in there and then you bake it in and then somebody is able to track where it came from and it's actually i think more businesses should do this it's just for me, super complicated to manage and make sure, did I embed the thing right? But more businesses do that. Even businesses like Adobe who own these tracking tools, they never put this in. Google doesn't put this in. Mm -hmm. I think it's a really underappreciated approach, but it is even so it's very difficult to tack on what's called attribution to why people are watching your videos and coming to your site and doing some sort of transaction. They may go, hey, I've heard about this, now I'm gonna to go to Google and check on that. So, you know, maybe it's the comments, maybe it's the email you get. Uh, Shelly, what do you think are some of the good metrics that are apart from views and subs that some people might say, you know what, that's something we can 
quantify? I think you also have to be very, very careful because one of the things that has happened to me in the past before too is I knew that I wanted to buy this specific thing that I'd been advertised on Instagram or Facebook multiple times. And I knew that if I just kept browsing and, and scrolling for a little bit, it was going to come up on my feed because it was there like yeah. every single time. So it wasn't even that I was, um, I mean, I saw it, let's say I was convinced on Facebook, but I went on to Instagram and that's where I knew that I would find it there. And that's where then I bought it. And so if you were to put the UTM tracking link in that, you would think, oh, well, Instagram is where I need to put all of my advertising dollars. Let's go ahead and do that. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't, it just, it was because I knew it was a place that I would find that ad. So we do have to be careful about that and putting too many, like too much belief in it because there are right. instances like that for everything. But another thing that you also want to look at is sometimes, um, and while it's great to have those additional metrics, sometimes the juice just isn't worth the squeeze. Because if you're some of these brands or businesses, if all you really care about is signups at the end of the day, and you have probably a pretty hefty budget, you could even have something on the back end, which was like, where did you hear about us? Or where was the code that you put in or something like that. And you can collect data on the backside too, to be like, okay, well, it looks like five times the amount of people coming in or finding us from Facebook or something. So you, you dump some more money into that. So I would be careful how much we put in there, although it's nice to have, um, but sometimes it may, it may not be worth setting up all of the extra effort to go into it. Now, when it goes into, yeah, it is a lot of work, right? And to maintain and to update and mm -hmm. what if you got that link wrong or what if you set it as part of the link description and then as a default and then it went to all 100 of your videos because you updated, but you were really trying to make sure you knew which specific video, all mm -hmm. your data is dirty now at this point and you just can't do anything about it. So right, you want to be careful with that. But like I said, if you were looking at metrics, it's going to be things like conversions. Um, it could be something like reduce or increase in churn. It could be new signups. It could be you know, um, uh, making sure like that you actually click on some or put in some sort of offer. So you're testing. Um, it could be something simple as here's a landing page that you get sent when you get clicked on one link versus another, where it shows different type or copy versus also a different one where you see it, where it has a percentage could even be something where you start to do a heat map on a screen where it shows, are they clicking because it's a percentage discount because they signed up for annual does it do anything when we put that first? So there's a lot of different things. And then one other thing that I want to throw in there is with the convergence of influencer video, what if actually what you're pumping in is money into the PR that you're sending out or into the advertising spots that you do? Like you don't see a ton of HelloFresh, um, let's say by themselves on their YouTube channel always, but you see them integrated into every single beauty and lifestyle type of person and blogger out there. So it's like, what are you spending on that year contract, you know, there too. So it could be anything from conversion from affiliates and um, people that you work with too. And, and Gwen, I wanted to ask you this question. So I'm getting email now from this company called Captera. I reviewed a, um, a platform on their website and they may have gave, gave me money or something that I don't really know why I did it, but they paid me like 10 or $15 to review a product as a hmm. online service. Now I'm not so sure I agree with that type of thing, unless it's a super qualified customer. Hmm. But if you're a company that gets, that's paying hundreds of dollars per lead, right. wouldn't it be worth it for you in your description? I'm just brainstorming here. Haven't seen anybody do this, but only for qualified customers in the description. Hey, Make a make ten dollars. Make a ten dollars Starbucks gift certificate if you fill out this qualified customer survey to find out what you're interested in. But you have to, you'd have to position it a bit so you'd have to actually know what you're talking about. So that that this couldn't be done by anyone. But what do you think about that? You know, as a way of bringing people in. You know, I think it's going to be, you know, one of the big things when I, I've been I've worked in influencer marketing. You have to think about is you know, what is, what is the cost of my product versus the opportunity here? Right. You know, so if you're, if you're pushing a very expensive uh, product, sometimes we would see like CAC customer acquisition costs that were like a, over a hundred bucks to get that person in. Cause it's a big decision. Then you might have something like I did a, a campaign once for like 
potato chips. They were selling potato chips online, which was weird to me in the first place. Okay. But that one, you needed a very small CAC, right? To make that worth it. So if you have a kind of a target CAC for your product that makes that that kind of ten dollar lead and again that's not a full conversion so that's not your full cap that's kind of the equivalent of like the you know the qualification stage the the the, the statement of interest stage like that click stage right mm -hmm. um and perhaps maybe dane it's also a good idea to you know decrease frustration for the people who are going to fill it out and won't be qualified is to kind of target that video directly to, you know like the topic of the video is fairly niche to that specific audience it's not so broad it's going to be bringing yes. in a ton of unqualified yeah. people so you just have to again one of the biggest difficulties and even businesses fall fall prey to this is you can't get distracted with oh well this video is getting me less views you want less views you you sh get it into your head you want less views because you want the right views so if you could have something really niche say shelly your friend can only sell in you know uh you know kansas like maybe she's gonna do a video about you know marshmallow recipes for i don't know what is a kansas sports team right you know jayhawks so go jayhawks correct okay this is jayhawk themed city marshmallow <laughs> desserts right so now you're qualifying your audience as they can't come in that yeah there's going to be some you know ex kansans but they probably have a parent there who could buy it for them for them and have it when they came home for christmas your higher percentage of your audience is going to be qualified right so uh and i want to ask shelly this so one of the things shelly you have you have a really unique experience because you both understand the all the tech things you worked in the tech world and you also really understand things like beauty and commenting and things like that so you have this in, super interesting intersection of understanding these different worlds what do you think about comments because some companies just beg and plead for any comment and some youtubers just can't get uh, you know can't just have too many comments, filtering comments, can't respond. Do you feel that a business, if it's getting a few hundred views per videos, is there a surefire way? Is Should comments really be what they are getting at? Because that engages their customers on a one-to-one -one basis on YouTube. I would say maybe. Uh, well, it depends. <laughs> it's been a while. It's been what a week. That's Shelly. That? It depends. Saves the day. <laughs> it depends. Um, so here's the thing: is if the comments are coming from a negative place because you did a really bad job in explaining the product, mm -hmm. either how it works or a return policy or something like that. A flood of negative comments, even if it is engagement, is just going to be a nightmare for, let's say, your support team or whoever is managing mm -hmm. your channel to do that. So that may not be a good thing. On the other hand, just encouraging someone to comment the word potato chip because you want to also increase comments they're kind of fluff throwaway comments that you just have to spend time weeding through. So not not all comments are important comments or business uh, revenue making potential comments either. So you would almost want to be very directive in the way that you structure the call to action maybe for the request for comments, you know, like comment, when's the last time you upgraded your car? or comment, what's the last car that you wanted to buy? Or what's the last car you went and test drove? Something like that. If you are a car dealership, now you're starting to understand who's watching, what kind of cars have they been looking at? When was the last time they were shopping? That's important, not only customer data, but that would be driving comments on, wow, have you seen the new Camaro? What do you think? Oh yeah, I saw that it has four, two wheel drive. I don't know anything about cars, okay? But it was like, <laughs> oh wow, did you know that we have one of those in stock you know, if you wanted to be in the area and test drive a new Camaro, we have that one. That is a comment that could encourage people to participate and possibly even lead to a sale for you. So that is a valuable comment versus comment potato chip or comment your favorite something emoji versus if you were the potato chip company, maybe it would be comment below your favorite type of chip. Is it crunchy? Is it thin? What flavor is it? And then all of a sudden you've got more market research for your brand, but there's pointless comments and there's ones that are going to get you closer to revenue generating activity. And what's really key here, I just actually had this conversation with the YouTube team uh, this week. Name is drop. that 
She's kind of a big deal. She's kind of important and a big deal. No big deal. This is just not me, like, spouting off out of my patoot. We want you to spout off. We just want to make fun of you. I verified this with the source that this was, this is true. So comments are not directly taken into account in terms of the success of your video. It's not like if you ask all your fans to comment potato chip, you're gonna have so many more comments. The algorithm gonna see that, and be like, "Oh, this must be a popular video. Let's push it." There is no direct effect on the algorithm, but here's what it can do: it is a signal for uh, for the um, for the uh, for as satisfaction, right? So if you comment, if you hit that like button, that is a satisfaction indicator for uh, for youtube to say hey this person likes this video on this channel so it's going to then more be more likely to show another of your videos so it's, it doesn't affect directly your current video but it can help future videos because they're more likely to get shown here's what i i just learned very recently that's very interesting to me which is if it's all individualized to the single person. So say, Dane, you're just one of those slap happy people who like comments and likes every single video. You just go crazy. Your thing is commenting, which is a thing. Commenters are literally a type of audience. Mm -hmm. Like you can have a very good super fan who never comments because they're just not a commenter. They're, they're, they're shyer. And then you can have these really big loud mouths that you think are your entire audience. They're not. They're a really small part. And those people it does not get as valued by YouTube because they're like, okay, this is not a great indicator of whether Dane really liked the video because he just feels like he's going to like every video anyways because he he's feels a comment to Holly. YouTubers. Correct. So, like, uh, you have to be very careful about your relationship to comments. Uh, it really is about building that relationship with the audience so that they want to come back and if they see your video again, they will click on it. And there is a slightly larger chance that they will see one of your videos to be able to click on it, come back. But it isn't one of those things that if you have people giving you throwaway potato chip comments, like that will do absolutely nothing. Zero, zero, zero oh. uh, positive impact. But I, I want to love I that wanna... this is the, the measuring stick we have. Potato chip chips. comments. <laughs> we, we need to bring that back every week. The potato chip comment. Remember the um, potato chip comments? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, and and we've talked about more about comments just in the past few minutes than probably all strategists have talked about in the history of time. But I really do value mm -hmm. comments, particularly for small businesses, particularly for businesses that are getting a few hundred views because fine you're telling me it's individualized fine you're telling me it's not totally a a you know value metric as as big as some other things might be but what does it do it engages your customer if mm -hmm. you're a business on a one to one basis and gives you an opportunity because you didn't know who they were before to say i thank you so much for commenting even if you had a bad experience i really appreciate you showing up and offering your valued opinion and we're working on it you know what we've been working we've been we're, our developers have been working night and day to solve that problem i uh, totally empathize with you i'm sorry it didn't work out for you we're working on it right now so i just wanted to let you know that you're right it, we, we we did that poorly we're working on it or something like that and i could tell you from someone who's worked in sales and marketing over time and also someone who has um worked with certain types of i would say geek celebrities in ways that even an email from the the celebrity's assistant is really valued by whoever it was so even if the comment is from dane's assistant because i'm so famous dane's assistant says hey dane's too busy right now but i can tell you that this is and this and this people are like wow he they really took the time he, he he can't comment himself but and that's why i always at the end of my comments i always put dash dane at the end of my comments someday i'm going to have a huge staff right i'm going to have hundreds of people managing my contents and comments and i want them each to put you know jenny phil you know not that phil but you know whatever just names that come to mind 
I actually wonder if that would hurt engagement if you did have a, a staff and had multiple people commenting because a lot of people would be like, but it's a video up channel and I want to see Dane. So I didn't get a comment from Dane. Dane didn't read it. Dane doesn't care. Dane puts it on his staff. Dane isn't engaged with his audience anymore. And I wonder if you just didn't sign it at all and it just came from your profile. So anyone who commented thought it was you, even if the disbelief in that relationship would be better than knowing and breaking that veil that it was someone from your staff. Well, that's Dane what is more honest you. than I am because I would do I do exactly what you do sh say, Shelly. It's like I have a full team that's working on all my channels, right? And I'm not having my coordinators like sign like you know sign their name as Taylor from Cosmo. Like it's just Cosmo answering, right? Even though, even in my case, you would assume there's no person named Cosmo and we have multiple talent, but at the end of the day, I just feel like it just, it has that slight negative connotation for the audience. Make it a clean profile. All then I'm saying, have, but Dane's an honest person. Yeah. I, I, I think that, that when you say honesty, I think clarity and directness win the day, but we have a question for you, Gwen, from Dole Whip Dab, who's yep. dad, who says it's, I often hear it's all engagement as it relates to comments and even formally dislikes. Gwen, when YouTube said comments don't matter, does that mean comments don't count towards engagement? Okay, this is really funny because this conversation started with the YouTube team, uh, the YouTube product team railing about how there's this myth that's gone around for years, which is like, and I, I, I will say that I believe this is 1.2, that if you, if you have a misspelling in your video, don't worry, it will just increase engagement and it will be good for you. YouTube hates this type of myth, especially, you know, in the fact that since about 2019, they've put in a lot of safeguards with satisfaction. Uh, you might see the surveys that go, they're looking at the, the likes, they're looking at the, at the activity around your video. And a dislike is seen as a not satisfied signal, a bad survey response. And you might be like, I've only seen a survey in the last year, but their AI is really, really good. So they can take the, the, the sample si set of surveys and they're using that to extrapolate satisfaction across who you're most similar with, right? So at the end of the day, if you're getting negative engagement, YouTube will figure that out and count that against you. So it, it gets very interesting. Again, uh, yes, comments count toward engagement, but the, the YouTube's point is that there is nothing in this ranking system that's ranking the videos to see what the likelihood they're going to put it up in front of you. That's saying for this specific video, like if you have X amount of comments, if you have more comments, it's going to do better than a video without as many comments. There's no direct correlation, uh, direct causation there. But is there, you know, like, yes, again, the activity of the individual person does affect their likelihood to get another one of your videos. So it gets a little bit confusing, right? There is the direct causation of queuing up of information that YouTube's using to say, I'm going to push this video. Uh, and then there's your satisfaction, your individual I think there's a satisfaction difference. with a channel. Yeah, between yeah. engagement, interaction, and satisfaction. Correct. You know, Absolutely. and if you think about this, just like in the beginning, they cared about video views, video views, video views, but then mm -hmm. all you had were these clickbait titles and people would watch it. It would qualify as a view technically, but they would have like 5% engagement or like um, average view duration. And so right. then they even changed it into, well, we want satisfied viewers. We don't want them to get so pissed off at all of these clickbait things that they just jump off the platform or jump off the video. And so it became, how long can you keep them watching? What can you do to drive more minutes? And then it became about minutes matter most, right? It came about average view right. durations and it came, and then it, it came backwards a little bit. And now it's about returning viewers, right? And that's mm -hmm. also yeah. engagement and satisfaction because a lot of us, there was a certain video that went out there when Adpocalypse 2 happened. Um, a lot of people had a lot of engagement on that video. It was not a right. video that YouTube wanted a lot of engagement on, even though there was a right. lot of interaction on. And eventually it was pulled down from the platform. But you have to think what happened even in that case was removal from the preferred ad system and also demonetization for a while, as well as 
a person who went away from the internet for a while and they came back. But if you were to look at it through the lens of, well, it got a lot of comments, it got a lot of mm -hmm. thumbs up or thumbs downs, whatever, there was a lot of interaction, but there wasn't a lot of satisfaction. So Correct. now we've had now this swing backwards of, okay, we want viewers to be satisfied and we want them to keep returning. So it's difficult because we used to live in a time when it was just about clickbait, the view and mm -hmm. the interaction, whether it was bad comment, you know, and that's why you had a lot of people negative things. And now mm -hmm. it's about satisfaction, average view duration in return. Absolutely. It's very key to listen to the terminology that YouTube uses. And in this specific case, when they use the word engagement, they do not mean comment and likes like the rest of us do. So this has confused a lot of people because you'll hear them in videos or they'll release something and they'll be like, engagement is up. And you're like, oh, there are a lot of comments. Uh, they have kind of two buckets. They have engagement and they have satisfaction. And those are the two things they're optimizing for. For them, engagement is defined as clicks and essentially uh, at like uh, how far they get into the video. That to them is is engagement. It's click through rate and, and audience average. retention. Correct, exactly. That to them is engagement. So when they use the word engagement, they don't mean likes and comments. That sort of falls into a little bit into satisfaction, but it's not a huge part of like it's a part, and it's individualized to you on how important they weight that. But they've also said it's not a huge. It's not the a huge motivating factor. It's okay. not a big part of the equation. I want to ask you as a customer, you have come to a brand's website. Maybe it's a software company. Maybe it's a camping equipment. Maybe it's some sort of bicycle that folds up. I don't know what that is. You have an interest in a product. You've, For instance, you've expressed interest uh, recently, Gwen, in uh, some sort of home exercise, something. Yeah. So let's say you didn't know that brand existed. Mm -hmm. And you found that brand through a YouTube video about something, whether you found it through browse, suggested, or search, doesn't matter. Now you've watched one video. How many videos do you think it would take for you to watch on that same channel for you to consider buying the product or doing business with that company? How many videos? On that single channel? That same um, channel. That same business channel. channel. Business, the business channel? Or yeah, like maybe. It, yeah, it could be it. something. It could be It could be totally varied. It could be a car company. It could be like the Salesforce channel. It could be the TubeBuddy channel. It could be um, one of the people who make up fold, fold up bicycles. Whatever the thing is, how many videos does it take to get you to say, these are one of the people I'm considering giving my money to. What's so interesting here is it gets very like nuanced. Like, would I want to watch seven videos of you shilling me that product? Absolutely not. Maybe I want one or two videos talking about that product, but to develop the goodwill, that means that I trust you enough as a business to be like, I'm going to convert. Then I would like another three or four videos, right? You know, and or do a little remarketing on me and then have, you know, have it pop up in other places or say, get some creators that I watch you know, re and have them do some uh, an integration, then I feel like, wow, it's not just this person telling me I'm hearing it everywhere. So this must be something I want to buy. I, I, I just want to break down. Say, yeah. I, I just want to break down. We'll, we'll go to you next show. I just want to break down because Gwen just downloaded a whole bunch of stuff there. Really great stuff. So what Gwen said was that, would she want to see you five pitch videos? She would not. She said, but if they were sort of helpful videos, maybe three or four videos, plus then the business can remarket, which means coming at the customer with, could be a Google ad, could be a Facebook ad, could be a YouTube video or series that just said, hey, you liked one, let's send you more. Or it could be maybe they're looking now doing some searches and they want to hear what the influencers have to say about it. Now that's a lot of stuff and that's a very sophisticated, but actually not too difficult to execute campaign. Shelly, you wanna add or critique what Gwen said? 
I was going to agree that nobody wants to watch five or 10 videos, usually from the manufacturer or the company that it, that they're going to be purchasing possibly from a lot of the time because you get all of the shiny bells and whistles. So you might have a couple that are like, here's the features and benefits of our exercise machine. And then you're going to be like, all right, exercise machine plus review 90 days later whatever else it is. And you want to see real world people who have used it, unboxed it. Do they find it helpful? What do they hate about it? Right. And then all of a sudden you get down the rabbit hole of why I would not recommend you buy this one or buy this one versus this one instead. And then you're going to want to also have a couple of opinions from maybe a couple of trusted fitness professionals. So maybe it's blog or it's someone else, some other influencer that you trust. Like, I don't know, I just seen who has her own home gym. And so you're usually going to get a conglomeration of all of these different pieces. And it's usually never going to be all from the manufacturer of said bicycle or equipment piece. And even when, um, you know, we had given the example of if you were making content for your people and your product, I would still recommend something like a 60, 30, 10 split for you can't just sell everything. It has to be a smaller percentage of videos than here's how to assemble it. Here's how to clean it. Here's how to service it. Here's how to whatever, all the support stuff you need. And then here's how to buy it if you want it. And, and we advise we advise businesses to make helpful how-to videos that also you know combine storytelling within those tips about what you would do if you didn't know the business existed. So, for instance, um, should you get a fold-up? We're, we're say, let's say we're we're a fold-up bicycle company. Should you get a fold-up bicycle? And that is a, a video. That as a company, I know exactly should you, shouldn't you. Hey, if you're going to go 100 miles today, no, you should not get a fold-up bicycle. If Do you live in an apartment or in an urban area where you need to bring things in and out of the building, but you don't have storage space? Well, yes, you should. And you can go through all that without ever saying that I'm the XYZ company, but that you can say, and by the way, we make we make bikes like this you know, check out our videos here or check out more information below. Now you've provided value. You've helped be an honest arbiter without actually selling. And what does the view, when somebody gives you free advice, you feel, you feel beholden to that person, don't you? If your neighbor loans you a lawnmower or a whatever, you're like, well, they loaned me this. Now I can loan them the barbecue or whatever the thing is. You feel an exchange needs to be made, even if the business doesn't know you existed. They don't know who you are, but you feel compelled to say, well, they've given me so much good stuff. And I believe that a, a connection is made when someone watches three of your business's videos that are not about your service. They've asked you for your expertise three times. And after that period, you have a shot at their business. You may not get it. The price may not work. The timing may not work. I believe you have a shot at their business. Yeah. If you were like an exercise bike company, then you might make videos like how to determine what size bicycle seat you need or how to determine how high the seat should be. It's still information that is valuable, even if they don't use your bike, but you demonstrate using the bike that you sell and you say, oh, this is the model that we just came out with this year. This one is, you know, very popular amongst people that are riding in the urban streets because they need uh, frames that are a little bit lighter so they can carry it up the stairs as well as ones that are a little bit smaller so they can pack them on whatever as they're going. So you weave in little moments of what's kind of a cool feature and benefit of your product while still providing some educational thing that's evergreen enough that could be a standalone video in itself and still helpful. Gwen, uh, tell us about how um, a business can incorporate videos not from employees on their own YouTube channel. You talk about working in for influencers or with influencers. Should we create a playlist of influencer videos on our channel? And if oh. so, should we oh, pay absolutely. them for that? I would um, look, look, you don't, uh, you don't have, like if you did not solicit it, there's nothing that says you can't make a playlist that uh, encompasses what people are talking about you on, on, on the platform. Now, what I would advise, the mistake I see a lot of companies make is they get these influencers to make videos that then live on like the company's channel. 
very less, much less effective for you. Let me, let me tell you, like what you want to do is have them make videos on their own channel and then playlist them on your channel. And yes, in that case, you are going to have to pay them. <laughs> but if it literally is like, here is like 10 people who in the wild have talked about our product for whatever reason, nothing says that you can't, you know, put that on a playlist on your, on your channel page. I, I see so few businesses just finding these because even businesses that have great, great commenters making use of the playlist function and featuring mm -hmm. some great reviews or tutorials right on their own channel homepage. It costs mm -hmm. you nothing. It is totally legal and legit within the YouTube thing. You didn't, whether you paid them or not, it doesn't really matter. It is totally legit. However, if you see these people and they are doing a great job, you should consider them for your influencer program, certainly. Yeah, yeah you well, should, should reach do... out to them and say, yeah. hey, I saw this video that you made. I've had that happen to me. And thank you so much. You happen to make this video about my product. And then it's right. also then helping them find people who are genuinely interested in their product versus one who will just make a video because they were sent the product. So if you already purchased right. it or got it or downloaded it, whatever it is, and then you make a video saying how great it is, then why wouldn't you be like, hey, by the way, that was awesome. Do you want to sign up for an affiliate um, program? We offer one. Or we've never worked with influencers before. Can we share your video? Or how does that work? Or right. that kind of relationship building that happens from that, the least you can do as well and be like, here's what our customers are saying about us and have a playlist of videos from influencers as well because you can throw a little back their way and be like, hey, I'm going to create a playlist. I'm going to put you here on my homepage. And you know, like, you know, you're going to get more eyeballs on your videos. Hopefully if someone comes to our video and starts and watches this video. So Dang, it's symbiotic. Yeah. You think we should do an entire episode where we just pick Shelly's brain about <laughs> Amazon video. And it starts like, now. It starts what? now. Oh, uh, <laughs> look, I have places to be after this. This is, this is a long <laughs> conversation, man. But it's just like, this is what Amazon is doing, right? They're encouraging an ecosystem where people just make videos about someone's brand they have no connection to. And it's a beneficial thing for both parties. Okay, yeah. I'm going to I'm going to uh I'm going to do a juicy title like how Amazon will Amazon video will destroy YouTube. Everyone will want to see that. <laughs> well, one way that they're doing it is um they have a much more generous payment system. So, we can talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, and we will talk about that. We're gonna, so that's what we're going to talk about next week. We're just going to ask Shelly to tell us <laughs> all the things she knows about the Amazon video. And if you don't know, Shelly, this is not, she didn't ask for this promotion. I'm giving nope. you five. I got Shelley voluntold. Saves. Thank you. <laughs> you know, follow Shelly Saves the Day on Amazon video. But that is not, that will not disqualify her for anything because she didn't ask me to say that. Nope. So um, this has been a great conversation. My name is Dane Golden from the Video Marketing Business Academy where we help you up your game on YouTube for business and transform your viewers into loyal customers. Shelly Saves the Day, where can people find you? You can find me at Shelly Saves the Day everywhere except for Twitter, which is Shelly Saves the. And Gwen Miller, YouTube channel? Uh, getting very close. I've done some test footage just because you've been like, you've been on me, Dane. You've been my inspiration. We're getting, we're getting much closer. And, and Gwen Miller, of course, uh, just look into the various wonderful Hearst YouTube channels. You can see her thumbprint everywhere because she has the finger on the pulse of Hearst content for YouTube. What are some of those great channels? Just so people know, they don't need promotion from us, but just so people know. <laughs> Just in case you haven't heard of some little brands like Cosmo and Seventeen, uh, but if you're say male, we also have Esquire and Men's Health. We just launched a new uh, uh, channel called Men's Health Muscle. If you're looking to like get a little bit more ripped this this, this spring, go there. Or if you're like me who just loves puttering around the house, you always have the ever popular and lovable Good Housekeeping. And, and like uh, twenty more. <laughs> what's that? And like, and like 20, 20 more. more, she said. <laughs> yeah, into cars, we got cars for you. You like putting on your tennis shoes and running, we got something there. You want to be on a bicycle, we got you too. Do you have anything about bedding? Good, Good housekeeping. housekeeping. We're actually doing, that's our we, That's our big <laughs> spring push is, is bedding actually. That's a callback from a previous episode. <laughs>
So uh, until next week, here's to helping you help your customers through video.